Mr. Speaker, I rise today in support of this six-bill appropriation package. I'm glad we are here to consider full-year bills, and I want to thank everyone who participated in this process. With the odds stacked against us, House Republicans made pr pr progress in how we fund the government. We drafted the most conservative bills in history. Members submitted over 1,000 amendments. We considered House bills individually on the floor, and we avoided a massive ominous measure. In total, we increased defense funding and made target cuts. We also made, uh, maintained our legacy uh, under my co colleagues on the other side of the aisle want to remove. Overall, this bill honors our commitment to our veterans, strengthens our energy security, hold agencies accountable, support our farmers and ranchers, and makes our transportation system safer. I urge my colleagues to support this bill and I reserve the balance of my time. General lady from Texas reserves. Gentleman from California is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It is regrettable that I must rise in opposition to the measure before us. I'm anguished over it for one simple reason. Veterans' lives are on the line. I have the greatest respect for my colleague, the ranking member of the Appropriations Committee, and I know it was a difficult road to get to this point. And I also appreciate the work of our Democratic leader to try and find consensus. There are many good things in this bill, things that will benefit everyday Americans. But as ranking member of the House Veterans Affairs Committee, this bill comes at the expense of our most vulnerable veterans. And therefore, I cannot support it. However, I want to be clear that I am not asking my colleagues to oppose the bill. Uh, Mr. Mr. Speaker, I reserve. The gentleman from California reserves. The gentlelady from Texas is recognized. I yield to the gentleman from Kentucky, the chairman of the Commerce, Justice, Science, Subcommittee and Dean of the House of Representatives. For what amount of time? I thank the three chair minutes. Lady. Three minutes. Gentleman is recognized for three minutes. I thank the chair lady for uh, yielding. Mr. Speaker, as chairman of the subcommittee on commerce, justice, science, and related agencies, I rise in support of the Appropriations Act that we're considering today. The fiscal situation facing the nation requires Congress to make significant spending reductions while maintaining strong commitments to the safety, security, and well-being of the American people. After tough but fair bipartisan negotiations, We've produced a strong bill that prioritizes everyday Americans while right-sizing the uh, bureaucracy. Make no mistake, Mr. Chairman, many agencies with important missions face reductions under this legislation. We believe it's important to reverse the out-of-control growth of the federal government and that is reflected in this agreement. The CJS bill scales back spending by holding most agencies to, to uh, 23 levels or lower. Agencies must refocus on their core missions and responsibilities. Despite limited resources, we maintain robust funding that prioritizes the fight against fentanyl, support for local law enforcement, and efforts to counter China by supporting innovation, space exploration, and scientific research. We do this while also utilizing the power of the purse to address the weaponization of the Federal Bureau of Investigation and the overreach of the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, 
and explosives. To that end, the FBI and ATF will be receiving less money than last year. In addition, the CJS bill contains two new policy riders to protect the American people. One prohibits the Department of Justice from targeting parents who exercise their right to free speech at local school board meetings. The other prohibits the Department of Justice from investigating churches on the basis of their religious beliefs. The bill supports local law enforcement by including critical funding for burn justice grants and cops hiring grants. Ask additional two minutes. You expand. Gentlemen, is recognized for an additional two minutes. This assistance will help empower our local police departments and ensure they have the resources they need to safeguard our neighborhoods. Law enforcement plays an important role in the well-being of every American in every congressional district. Passage of this bill today sends a strong message. We have their backs. In closing, I want to thank uh, Chairwoman Granger. She's been a, a trooper in tough circumstances and has done a wonderful job, and I congratulate her. I also want to thank the subcommittee ranking member, Mr. Cartwright. He's been a valued partner and colleague in this effort. I also want to thank all the members of the subcommittee for their help and assistance, as well as Ranking Member DeLauro. This legislation is a product of good faith, bipartisan negotiations. It's a win for the American people. So I urge my colleagues to support this legislation, and I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman from Kentucky yields back. Gentlelady from Texas reserves. Gentleman from California is recognized. Mr. Speaker, I yield three minutes to the gentlewoman from Connecticut, the distinguished ranking member of the Appropriations Committee, Ms. DeLauro. Gentlelady is recognized for three minutes. I rise in support of this legislation, which provides funding for domestic programs that curb the rising cost of living, that creates higher paying jobs, that confronts the climate crisis. It honors our commitments to America's veterans, and it protects women's rights. In a divided country, I am pleased that Democrats and Republicans in the House and in the Senate united and produced this legislation to make government work for the people. Democrats are doing what we always do, put people over politics, follow the law, and reach a bipartisan compromise to grow the middle class and to deliver for the American people. This bill includes a billion dollars to fully fund the Women, Infants, and Children program. It prevents five million people from losing their housing. It increases our investments in our infrastructure and creates jobs. It restores funding for rail and transit systems. These funding bills, the product of bipartisan negotiations, help keep our community safe and healthy. We are keeping government open, protecting the people in need, and moving our country forward. This legislation does not have everything either side may have wanted. But I am pleased that many of the stream cuts and policies proposed by House Republicans were excluded. House Democrats rejected outright their archaic restriction on women's reproductive health care. I am proud that this bill protects the progress we previously, previously made to reverse underinvestment in domestic programs that empower and protect middle class families. To help Americans contending with an elevated cost of living, this bill fights inflation. It fully supports key lifelines such as food assistance, ensuring people in this great country of ours do not go hungry. I urge swift passage of this package, and I look forward to finalizing and passing the remaining 2024 
funding bills in due time. I yield back the balance of my time. General Lee, lady yields back. Gentleman from California reserves. General lady from Texas is recognized. I yield to the gentleman from Idaho, the ranking member of the Interior and Environmental Subcommittee, Mr. Simpson, for four minutes. Gentleman is recognized for four minutes. I thank the, chair, uh, the chairman for yielding the time. Uh, I rise in support of the Consolidated Appropriations Act for 2024. I'd like to com commend Chairwoman Granger for her leadership of the Appropriations Committee and for getting the first six bills across the finish line. I would also like to thank the Interior Subcommittee Ranking Member Pingree for her partnership on this bill. Together, we've negotiated a reasonable compromise to avoid a government shutdown that fails to respond to our nation's needs and maintain our public lands. The Interior and Environment Division provides non-defense top-line resources totaling $38.9 billion, nearly 4% below the FY 2023 level. Cutting funding is never easy, but with the national debt in excess of $34 trillion, we make tough choices in this bill to rein in federal spending. Last Congress alone, $3 trillion was spent outside the normal appropriation process. That's $3 trillion additional dollars. As I have said repeatedly, simply holding funding flat is not enough. We must curb out-of-control spending and get our budget back on track, and I'm pleased that this bill does that and heads us in the right direction. We reduced funding across most agencies and bureaus, and the Environmental Protection Agency is cut by nearly 10 percent. Despite the reduced allocation, the bill provides for an additional $34 million for health care, law enforcement, and the related programs across Indian country. And for the Indian Health Services, the bill continues advanced appropriations totaling $5.2 billion. That's a program, the advanced appropriation, that was started by Ranking Member Pingree when she was chairman of this committee. And we've continued that. The bill also fully funds payment in lieu of tax, the payment in lieu of uh, taxes program. Let me explain that that program is vitally important to public land states the, in, because we can't collect taxes on federal lands within, within uh, those states. This is supposed to make up for the taxes that would be, uh, a pro, uh, would come from those, from those lands if they were held in private lands. So uh, this is vitally important to public land states. It's not enough but we fully funded it in, uh, in this program. It also provides an additional $260 million to maintain wildland firefighter pay without irresponsible budget gimmicks. In terms of policy, the bill maintains longstanding legacy riders to prevent the SA listing of sage grouse and to exempt farmers and livestock producers from burdensome greenhouse gas permitting requirements. The bill bolsters our energy independence by encouraging domestic production of critical and rare earth minerals and rejects administration proposals to increase offshore energy inspection fees and authorize onshore inspection fees. And for my constituents in Idaho, I'm especially pleased that the bill blocks the Lava Ridge Wind Project until the Interior Secretary analyzes in consultation with, in consultation with, local officials and stakeholders, and they look at alternative plans to reduce the harmful impacts of this project. In closing, I want to thank all the members for their work on this bill. It is hard to reduce spending, but yet we've been able to do that. And I'd like to uh, congratulate the staff on both sides of the aisle that worked very hard on this. While we were home, they were here working on this bill all night long. And I'd like to include the staff on the other side of the rotunda. These bills are hard to compromise, but we were able to get it done. It represents a fair compromise that allows us to meet the spending levels agreed to in the Fiscal Responsibility Act and manage our public lands. I urge my colleagues to vote yes on this uh, piece of legislation. I yield back my time. Chairman yields back. The gentlelady from Texas reserves. The gentleman from California is recognized. Mr. Speaker, I yield two minutes to the gentlewoman from Ohio, the distinguished ranking member of the Energy and Water Development Appropriations Subcommittee, Ms. Kaptur. The gentlelady is recognized for two minutes.
Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I rise in support of this bill. The fiscal year 2024 Energy and Water Bill ushers in new horizons for jobs and progress for our region and nation. Our bill assures investments in modernized energy production, vital water infrastructure, and nuclear national security, all essential for American independence inside our borders. This bipartisan energy and water bill funds the U.S. Department of Energy, Corps of Engineers, Bureau of Reclamation, and regional commissions and authorities impacting every corner of our nation. This includes the Appalachian, Delta, Denali, Northern Border, Southeast Crescent, Southwest Border, and the Great Lakes region. U.S. energy independence in perpetuity is our consistent, paramount, strategic goal, and each year our nation makes significant progress toward it. This bill also assures our nation's nuclear security assets, including the nuclear Navy, are modern and ready, both as a deterrent and to safeguard our national security. With Vladimir Putin's recent reckless threats about launching nuclear weapons in Europe and former President Donald Trump's appeasing reaction, this bill is needed as an affirmation of American will to protect and defend our people and assure our nation's security posture against all enemies. I urge my colleagues to join me in supporting this bipartisan bill and thank our able chair, Charles Fleischman, for his dutiful and responsible service to our nation. I yield back. General Lady yields back. I reserve. General from California reserves. General Lady from Texas is recognized. I yield to the gentleman from Oklahoma, the chairman of the Committee on Rules and the chairman uh, of the Transportation, Housing, Urban Development Subcommittee, Mr. Cole, three minutes. Uh, distinguished gentleman from Oklahoma is recognized for three minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank uh, the chairwoman for yielding. I want to begin with some much-deserved thank yous. I want to thank the Speaker of this House. This deal would not have come together without his leadership and support. I particularly want to thank my, my chairwoman, Chair Granger, and Ranking Member Delora for their work and their leadership in putting a package together that can get across this floor in a bipartisan manner. And I'd be remiss not to thank my negotiating uh, part counterparts, uh, Ranking Member Quigley and Senator Schatz and Ranking Member Hyde-Smith on the Senate side of the rotunda. They were just terrific to work with in every way. And finally and always, we have outstanding staff. We all know what that, and uh, this bill wouldn't be here without their hard work. Uh, obviously, I want to focus my remarks, Mr. Speaker, very quickly on the portion I, of the bill that I had the most to do with, and that's the uh, uh, transportation, housing, and urban development uh, uh, portion. There are four areas in, the, in that bill I'm especially proud of. First, members of both parties and both sides of the aisle, excuse me, both sides of uh, the rotunda, worked really hard on safety first. Safety for people that are flying, safety for people that are traveling by rail, safety for men and women on the highways. And uh, we met the requirement there and fully funded all those agencies. Second, this is probably the most robust funding that the Federal Aeronautical Agency has ever received. We have money in there for 1,800 new traffic controllers who are desperately needed. We have additional money for technology and for infrastructure programs and simulators to make sure they get the most up-to-date training we can possibly provide for them. Uh, so that was a real accomplishment, and it marries up very nicely with the FAA reauthorization bill that I hope we pass uh, later this Congress. Third, uh, we maintain the safety net for people in public housing. We all know what has happened to the cost of rents and housing, uh, and frankly, we didn't want to put anybody out of their home, and we avoided doing that. Finally, uh, and particularly important to me personally, we have historic gains for Indian housing programs and Indian road programs in this bill. Again, none of that could have happened without the people I thanked earlier, the Speaker, particularly the chairwoman and the ranking member of the subcommittee and my negotiating partners. So I urge passage of this legislation, Mr. Speaker. I'm very proud to be associated and very proud that it will come to and move across this floor as it should in a bipartisan fashion. With that, Mr. Speaker, I yield back. back. Gentleman Lay from Texas Reserves, gentleman from California. Mr. Speaker, I yield two minutes to the gentleman from Georgia, the distinguished ranking member of the Agricultural Appropriations Subcommittee, Mr. Bishop. The gentleman is recognized for two minutes. Mr. Speaker, I support passage of this six-bill package, including the section on agriculture, rural development, FDA, and related agencies. The Ag Bill affects the lives of every single American, rural, urban, and
and suburban every single day and ensures that Americans have access to abundant, safe, and affordable food, fiber, medicine, and medical devices. The bill takes care of our families, helps prevent hunger, fully funds SNAP, as well as WIC. The bill is free from almost all of the extreme policy riders in the previous versions, and it rejects interference with Americans' health care and reproductive freedom, as well as attacks on diversity, equity, and inclusion training. It protects the Ag Secretary's authority to use the CCC, and it blocks cuts to distressed farm service agency borrowers who help the farmers who feed our country. It rejects severe cuts to rural electric co-ops of the REAP program, which help rural businesses save on energy costs and help make rural energy grids more sustainable and resilient. It protects small, medium poultry producers and promotes industry competition to reduce the cost of food. It makes crucial investments in rural housing rental assistance as well as the Food Safety and Inspection Service. While the bill is not the best, it brings us closer to the, than, earlier to, than the earlier versions to meeting the essential needs of the American people. I want to commend President Biden, the bipartisan leadership and staff of the House and Senate Appropriations Committees, and I urge my colleagues to support the bill. Yields back. Someone from California reserves. Mr. Speaker, I yield. Gentleman well, I, reserves. I reserve. I reserve. I reserve. Gentleman reserves. Gentleman from Texas, recognized. Before I yield to the gentleman from Tennessee, I want to thank him for his important contribution to this bill. He's been wonderful to work with and side by side, and I appreciate that very much. I yield to the gentleman from Tennessee, the chairman of the Energy and Water Subcommittee, Mr. Fleischman, for three minutes. Gentleman's recognized for three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I thank our wonderful chair for yielding time to me, and I really appreciate your kind words. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I rise in strong support of the Consolidated Appropriations Act for fiscal year 2024, particularly the Energy and Water Development Appropriations Bill. As chairman of that subcommittee, I worked hard to ensure the bill includes many House Republican priorities. At a total of $58.2 billion, the bill advances our national security, our energy security, and our economic competitiveness in a fiscally responsible manner. To support our nuclear deterrent, the bill funds the National Nuclear Security Administration at $24.1 billion, an increase of almost $2 billion above fiscal year 2023. Specifically, the bill fully funds all major weapons and infrastructure modernization activities, including the W-93 warhead, the nuclear sea-launched cruise missile, which is a variant of the B-61 gravity bomb, and the restart of plutonium pit production capability. On the non-defense side of the bill, I was very pleased to be able to secure increases for the funding for the Department of Energy Office of Science, including fusion energy science. This funding will enhance America's role as the global leader of scientific discovery and lay the foundation for future scientific breakthroughs. The programs funded in the Energy and Water Bill also help improve our nation's energy security to reduce our reliance on foreign sources of critical materials. The bill provides strong support for the full spectrum of production technologies. Remaining the leader in nuclear technologies will ensure reliable energy here at home and will help allies across the globe. The bill sustains the Department of Energy's nuclear energy base program and also redirects previously appropriated funds to higher priorities. Specifically, $2.8 billion to develop a domestic capability for producing low enriched uranium, including high assay low enriched uranium that will be necessary for upcoming advanced reactors, and $910 million to support advanced modular reactor design and deployment activities. There are many other important provisions in this energy and water bill, but before my time is up, I want to congratulate Chairwoman Granger on bringing together this appropriation package. I'd also like to acknowledge the efforts of our colleagues across the aisle, especially my ranking member, Ms. Kaptur, and our colleagues across the Capitol. Finally, I'd like to thank the staff for all their hard work throughout this past year. 
our majority staff, Angie, Perry, Nora, Richie, Scott, Angelina, and Janet, in my personal office, Daniel and Ian, and on the minority side, Scott, Jocelyn, and Adam. This is a strong bill for America. With many House Republican priorities, I urge my colleagues to vote yes. Speaker, I yield back. Yeah, gentlemen's time has expired. Gentleman from Texas reserves. Gentleman from California. Mr. Speaker, I yield two minutes to the gentlewoman from Florida, the distinguished ranking member of the Military Construction and Veterans Affairs Appropriations Subcommittee, Ms. Wassman Schultz. Gentlelady is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the gentleman for yielding. As the MILCON VA Subcommittee ranking member, I support this minibus not only because we blocked nearly all poison pill policy riders, but it includes major Democratic priorities. We restored military construction funding to $2 billion above the budget request, dedicated resiliency and PFAS remediation funding, and boosted DOD housing oversight. We held strong on our commitment to veterans by providing $121 billion for VA medical care, increased and protected funding for gender-specific care for women, and blocked Republican attempts to further restrict women's abortion access and counseling. I'm so pleased my friend Chairman Carter and I joined forces to end harmful VA research on dogs, cats, and non-human primates within two years. President Biden and Congress built a minibus that lowers costs, creates jobs, funds food and housing lifelines, and fortifies America's energy independence with cutting-edge climate research. In other parts of this bill, I'm proud we fully fund Everglades restoration at the President's budget request of $415 million. President Biden has delivered time and time again for Florida's environment and Everglades restoration specifically. This funding allows restoration projects like the EAA Reservoir to continue to move forward so that we can save America's Everglades. And finally, these bills provide millions of dollars for community project funding back home. I secured more than $15 million in local projects headed towards Broward County, and communities across America will see similar assistance. In my community, that means funding to house veterans and help raise local streets in Hollywood to mitigate climate change. It means vital help for law enforcement to conduct more detailed investigations of human trafficking cases. I was able to secure support for local reef preservation, gen genetic disease research, water, sewer, and drainage upgrades, as well as help fix nagging local infrastructure repairs that my constituents navigate every day. For all these reasons, I urge my colleagues to support this minibus, and I yield back. General A yields back. General from California. I reserve. Reserves. General A from Texas. Recognized. Mr. Speaker, I reserve the balance of my time. General A from Texas reserves. Gentleman from California. General A Texas from reserves. Gentleman from California. Mr. Uh, Speaker. I yield two minutes uh, to the gentlewoman from Maine, the distinguished ranking member of the Interior and Environment Appropriations Subcommittee, Ms. Pingree. The gentleman is recognized. Uh, I thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank you to the gentleman for yielding the time. I, too, rise to support the Fiscal Year 2024 Consolidated Appropriations Act. I particularly want to thank Ranking Member DeLauro for her leadership and perseverance in working on this. Uh, and I also want to thank my uh, chair in the committee, Chairman Simpson, who's a, a pleasure to work with, and I appreciate your collaboration and partnership through this process. Thank you, too, to Chairwoman Granger for your work on this and to all of the staff who have made all the difference in us being able to put this together. Uh, as my colleague Chairman Simpson said, this wasn't necessarily an easy bill. It's never uh, easy to make cuts to programs that I consider vital um, and particularly important to what we do. But I am pleased that this bill continues our investments to care for our planet, to fight the climate emergency, and meet our trust obligations to tribal nations. This bill rejects the $13 billion in devastating cuts imposed in the House Republican bill originally and does not include more than 100 poison pill riders, policy riders. The bill provides necessary resources to deal with the threat of wildfires in the West and provides additional funding to continue the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act pay supplement for wildland firefighters. The bill also protects arts and humanities, maintaining the enacted funding level for the National Endowment for the Arts and the National Endowment for the Humanities, supporting arts and communities across this country. And finally, this bill supports Native American families by investing in a strong and resilient Indian country, including through education and health care programs. These are important investments to all Americans, and I urge my colleagues to support this bill. I yield back. Generally yields back. Gentleman from California. I reserve, Mr. Speaker. Gentleman from California reserve. Generally from Texas. Mr. Speaker, I reserve the balance of my time. 
The gentlelady from Texas reserves. The gentleman from California. Mr. Speaker, I yield three minutes to the distinguished gentleman uh, from Pennsylvania, uh, the ranking member of the Commerce, Justice, and Science Appropriations Subcommittee, Mr. Cartwright. This gentleman is recognized for three minutes. And I thank the gentleman. I rise in support of this bill. Uh, the Commerce, Justice, and Science Division of this bill preserves solid funding for an array of important public investments. For example, the Manufacturing Extension Partnership Program is level funded at $175 million. That's so important. The bill provides strong and continued level funding for NOAA climate research and NASA Earth science. But before I go on, I have some thank yous to, to hand out. Uh, we have incredibly hardworking staff. Bob Bonner, Shannon McCulley, Faye Cobb, Nora Faye spent, sent, spent countless sleep, sleepness, sleepless nights uh, working on this, this enormous project for this bill. And we can't leave out Chris Bigelow, Raquel Spencer, Adam Wilson, Jason Gray. Uh, these people have been indispensable in putting together this monumental piece of legislation. I'm thankful for the very hard work of, uh, of Chair Kay Granger and Chairman Hal Rogers, my counterpart on Commerce, Justice, and Science. Uh, also for the members of my subcommittee on the Democratic side, Grace Meng of New York, Dutch Rupersberger and David Trone of Maryland, Joe Morelli from New York. They've all worked hard on this, Mr. Speaker. And I'm thankful for the very, very hard work put in by Ranking Member DeLauro and especially for our leader, Hakeem Jeffries. These people together forced the removal of nearly 70 bad policy riders covering environmental policy, immigration, women's health, culture war issues, and more, including the removal of more than a dozen harmful gun riders. This bill provides robust funding for community policing, local justice assistance grants. It rejects the GOP's proposed cut of $400 million from the FBI, the FBI, which protects us from all sorts of murder and mayhem, the elite police force of our nation, we couldn't cut it like that, and we wouldn't let it happen. This bill provides $13 million in increase for programs under the Violence Against Women Act, continued level funding for grants under the Community Violence Intervention and Prevention Programs, the Stop School Violence Act, and the Victims of Child Abuse Act grants. Its level funding for correctional officers and the Bureau of Prisons is so important, and it provides a solid increase of $8 million for the DOJ Antitrust Division to help keep prices low in this country because they'll get away from us if we don't enforce our antitrust laws. I'm also proud that we secured continued level funding for the Legal Services Corporation. In summary, the CJS Appropriations Agreement represents a solid effort to preserve these priorities, and I do urge our fellow members to support it. I yield back. Time has expired. The gentleman from California. I reserve. The gentleman reserves. The gentleman from Texas. Mr. Speaker, I reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman reserves. The gentleman from California. Mr. Speaker, I yield two minutes to my colleague and friend from uh, the state of Texas, uh, Chip Roy. Gentlemen's recognized for two minutes. I thank the gentleman from California. I would note that we've only really had now two people speak in opposition to the bill out of the 40 minutes that have been on the floor. And that's just the reality of what we deal with here. The fact of the matter is, all of this is a shell game. Last year, Republicans were presented with a bill that was supposed to cap spending at $1.59 trillion. Now we have legislation that will do no such thing. Republicans will go around and they'll talk about how they scored major wins, how they somehow delivered for the American people. The fact of the matter is, we did no such thing. We signed up for caps at $1.59 trillion. We could have had $1.56 trillion if we would have passed a CR this year that would have triggered the caps. Limit safe growth that we passed was $1.471 trillion, but we're not doing that. We're going to blow the lid off of caps at $1.66 trillion. That's what we're actually going to do. While my Republican colleagues are going to run around and say that they somehow delivered cuts by saying $24 billion of cuts off of a CR that not one member of this body could come down to the floor and explain. 
And I would take that challenge. If any member of the body can come down and explain to the American people in terms that they can understand, explain it, exactly what the cuts look like. Because what you'll get are things like, oh, we cut 7% out of the FBI. But what they won't tell you is 95% of that cut is eliminating an earmark from Richard Shelby because Richard Shelby is no longer here to defend his pet project building back in Alabama. And they're going to say, oh, look, we're cutting the Department of Justice and the FBI. But the truth of the matter is we didn't get any of the major wins that we worked all last year to get. All of these things like defunding the sanctuary cities, refusing to report criminal aliens, gone. All of these measures are not in the bill. I rise in opposition to this legislation. I hope my Republican colleagues will oppose it. We deserve to deliver for the American people the way we said we would to cut spending and secure the border of the United States. I yield back. Gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman from California. I reserve. That's a gentleman from California reserves. The gentleman lady from Texas. Mr. Speaker, I reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman lady from Texas reserves. The gentleman from California. Mr. Speaker, I yield myself such time as I may consume. Gentleman is recognized. Mr. Speaker, I need to shine a light on an ugly truth buried deep in Section 413 of this bill. And what is this section all about? When a veteran applies for benefits they have earned, they are screened to make sure that they are competent to use those benefits to not take advantage of. If a veteran is determined to be mentally incompetent, they are appointed a fiduciary, and by law, they are reported to the National Instant Criminal Background Check System, otherwise known as the NICS list. A determination of mental incompetency uh, is typically based on a ver very serious mental health conditions like schizophrenia and dementia. And there, there, and, and there are very serious reasons why a person with those conditions should not be able to purchase a firearm. It is also the case that firearms are used in 68% of veterans' death by suicide. Suicide is a serious problem among veterans, and since I have had the honor to be on the Veterans Affairs Committee, I have fought to prevent the scourge of veteran suicide. So why on earth would this Congress cede one more important safeguard against a veteran's death? I personally cannot, and that is why I cannot support this bill. Republicans have pushed this type of provision for over a decade. I know, because I fought those, I fought every year against these, this provision. And they have done so with misinformation and fear-mongering. And Democrats have successfully fought this legislation in committee, which is why Republicans did not have the courage to bring this to the floor in the light of day and to have this body consider it through the normal process, through regular order. Instead, they crammed it into this must-pass bill enacting policy through the back door of a spending bill. They have abandoned all of their other so-called priorities because they wanted this so badly. They wanted, uh, they wanted so badly to make sure that vulnerable veterans could access more firearms. This is wrong. Lives are on the line. Veterans' lives are on the line. And I will not agree to legislation that will cause more people's lives to be lost to gun violence. House Democrats have been working to put people over politics. But it is clear that the Republican majority is content to put politics over veterans, including prioritizing politics over veterans' lives. I ask unanimous consent that the statement of administration policy on H.R. 4366 and a statement from uh, Giffords, the Giffords organization, which both speak to the harm of this provision, be entered into the record, Mr. Speaker. Without objection. I will not rest until this rider is gone from any future appropriations bill, and I urge my colleagues to join me in that effort. But for now, I must oppose this bill. There are a lot of good reasons, there are a lot of good things in this bill, and I don't ask my colleagues to join me in opposing this bill. I have a great deal of respect for my good friend, the ranking member of the Appropriations Committee, uh, Ms. Ms. DeLauro, and the significant amount of work that went into this. But I must follow my conscience because of my responsibilities to veterans. So thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I reserve. Gentleman reserves. Gentleman from Texas. Mr. Speaker, I urge my colleagues to support this bill, and I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman from Texas yields back the balance of her time. The gentleman from California. 
Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, I have no further speakers, and I'm prepared to close. Gentleman's recognized. Uh, I, I, I sadly must oppose the bill, but I do not urge my colleagues to do the same. 